Uh, meantime, let's bring in Walter Isaacson tonight, advisory partner at Perella Weinberg and a CNBC contributor, along with Eamon Javers here at Post 9. Walter, good evening. It's great to have you. Hey, good to be with you, Carl. Y your thoughts as you've been watching the returns tonight? I think this is a pretty historic shift. You've had more than 30 years now of a consensus uh, from Washington to Davos about free trade and lower tariffs and also free movements of people and capital. And a lot of people got left behind. You see, this is a global phenomenon of a bit of a populist backlash against this type of economic policy. I was just reading uh, Michael Sandel's book, Democracy's Discontents, and uh, there are just so many people now who can't have that security of a good job, and they blame it on the fact that we've had uh, too much free trade, too much immigration. And whether or not they're right, you can see that in Europe, you can see it here. Walter, you've spent about as much time with Elon Musk as anybody. Your fantastic book on him came out, though, maybe before his full pivot to being an American political figure and political icon as well. I wonder what you make of that, given the enormous amount of time that you spent with Elon Musk, uh, talking about all of his businesses, his rise to prominence, and now his rise to prominence as a political uh, prime mover in this country. Well, one of the last chapters in the book is called The Rabbit Hole. And even uh, a year or so ago, when the book came out, he was uh, spiraling, in my mind, too far towards these conspiracy theories. He embraced the populist, anti-woke agenda. And you could see, just as, uh, you know, it it's, was happening in a lot of the tech and uh, business industry, too, people grabbing this agenda. So it's not a particular surprise. It's all sort of laid out in the book. If Trump wins tonight, Elon Musk will be maybe the most powerful industrialist this country has ever seen with a huge role in the incoming administration in terms of uh, budget, finances, structure of contracting, all of those things, even at a time when he himself is a prime government contractor. How do you think he will handle that responsibility based on, on what you know of the man? You know, we saw what happened when he took over Twitter. And he went in and just within weeks got rid of 85 percent of the people, got rid of an entire yeah. server uh, farm in Sacramento using his own pliers and cutting the cables himself. He wants to do that throughout the federal government, meaning not trim it by 5 or 10 percent, but just total elimination of large parts of the federal government. I don't think, uh, leave aside, uh, you know, does it help SpaceX or Tesla? I think he's just on this mission. He watched how Malay did it, uh, you know, cutting uh, government departments down there. And I think it will be, you know, a somewhat uh, brutal sight, just as it was at Twitter if he's allowed to go in uh, and uh, try to cut the federal workforce and bureaucracy by more than 50 percent in some places. Well, that's why the phrase temporary hardship, Walter, had made such an impact on some. And Musk's response is to this notion that you would see hardship in some corners, uh, markets tumbling, sounds about right, was the uh, response that Musk wrote on X. I wonder how you think markets We'll, we'll take it if it comes to pass. Well, we'll see how much can actually be done. It's far easier when you buy Twitter outright to then fire 85 percent of certain departments. It's a little bit harder in the uh, federal government, of course, as civil service yeah, protection. Yeah, a lot harder. <laughs> and uh, you've got Congress, and Congress gets to appropriate the money. But if we see Congress being in the hands of, uh, you know, both houses of Congress being in the hands of Republicans and all the regulatory agencies, you're going to see a pretty major shock therapy, uh, both to regulation and to spending and to uh, the workforce of the federal government. 